project. So it's so great to hear that she's doing that on the Omer now. It's amazing. Um, okay, welcome back. Thank you for being here and joining us. Um, just to remind you of where we were last week and where we're going to today. So last week, we spent some time with the writings of the Eish Kodesh with Rabbi Kolonimus Kalman Shapiro, writing from 1939 to 1942. Um, and one of the things that we were seeing in the writings of the Eish Kodesh is he talks about um, faith as being, sometimes we think about faith as simply, you know, there are things that I know, and sometimes there's something that I don't know that I'm unsure about. And that's where faith comes in, right? That faith is almost like a stopgap to the things that I don't know. And he was saying that actually faith is something much deeper than that, that faith is actually a type of soul sight um, of the soul, like this deep way of knowing, this deep way of seeing. Um, and through this like deep way of knowing, it's a way of getting a glimpse of God's holy light and getting some sort of future vision, almost like a prophecy, he was saying, of what's to come, um, that in times of darkness, um, both in times of joy and in times of darkness, this soul sight, this faith, um, this prophecy um, allows us the ability to imagine another future that is different from the moment that we are in. Um, and something else that he talks about faith, and we were reading in last week's um, essay in, in his drasha, is he talks about the way in which faith is something that's inherited, that faith, this soul sight was handed down to us from our avot, from our ancestors. Um, and there's a sense in which our faith doesn't depend upon us. We don't have to do anything to have faith, that God forbid we could even be in a moment um, that we're so broken, things feel so hard that we feel that we don't have any faith. And he said, God forbid that we should say that we don't have faith. God forbid that someone should say, Eno ma'amin. Um, that even in those moments, that person is ma'amin, that person does have faith, they are a believer. It's just that they don't, they don't feel it. And why, he says, because faith is something that is um, a gift to us, that's inherited to us by our ancestors, that faith is like the beating of our heart. It's like the breathing of our lungs, um, things that are so essential to our body and to our life and functioning that they have to happen subconsciously sort of in the background, even if we are not aware of them. He then he then did say, it's possible for us to become aware of our faith, to choose to draw focus to our faith and sort of through this um, practice of faith or practice of love, we could grow the portion of faith that we we were inherited from our ancestors. Um, Cheryl actually, after the session emailed me, she had a really beautiful insight um, she was thinking about the connection between faith, which is emunah, with, you know, the aleph, mem, nun as the root, as the shores there, and lihit amen, which is like to practice, um, or it's like to exercise, to train, to, in that sense. And so she was thinking about the, the connection between emunah as faith and lihit amen as something that is a practice that we work at, which I thought was just so beautiful. So he does say that even though some of the faith is handed down to us, we're able to draw focus, we're able to be sort of like meet amen on, on our faith, and then able to grow that lot. So that was that was the age quotas where we were last week. Um, I want to actually move us back a little bit of in, in time. We're going to be looking at some, I think, really special texts from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Um, Rabbi Nachman, um, he's coming to us from 18th century Ukraine. Um, he, um, his great grandfather was the Baal Shem Tov, who is one of the early founders of Hasidism. Um, and Rabbi Nachman, one of the things that he, he's known for a lot of the things, I'll, I'll say like two, two things that really struck me about his writing. Um, one thing that he's known for, um, is Rabbi Nachman himself experienced a lot of hardship and sadness, um, in his life, a lot of brokenness in his life, even just in terms of his own children. Um, he had two sons and two daughters who died in infancy. Um, his wife died young of tuberculosis, and then Rabbi Nachman was sick and died just a couple of years after that at the age of 38. He produced so much Torah um, and died relatively so young. Um, and so even just in his life, his life is was really marked with a lot of loss and a lot of sadness. And so a lot of his Torah is sort of about grappling with um, despair and darkness and brokenness and hopelessness and yet trying to find that way to God um, sort of despite that and also I would really say through that I heard this really beautiful teaching um, Cheryl I'll get you the link so that you can send it out afterwards a podcast on Rabbi Nachman um, where the teacher was saying 
talking about how Rabbi Nachman uses the language of dafga and daika a lot in his teachings. It's sort of like, it's hard to translate dafga and daika, but it's almost like precisely. And one of the things he teaches is that you might think in his writings that he is saying sort of despite, afal pichen, despite the darkness, despite the brokenness, I find my way to God. And that actually a lot of what Rabbi Nachman is teaching is that it's dafka or daika, it's dafka through the brokenness or daika precisely in these moments of brokenness and sadness that I find my way to God, that I, that I, so you could see how this is going to come to be relevant to our conversation of faith. That's precisely in the moments where it would make sense to not have faith, that that's, that's where I find that faith. Um, so Rabbi Nachman, this is all just to say that Rabbi Nachman is a great um, person to turn to, to turn to, to think about what it means to have faith um, in times of brokenness and hardship and despair. The other thing that I'll just say about Rabbi Nachman, if you haven't had a chance to learn Rabbi Nachman yet, um, is a lot of his writings are um, written and given over in a way to be sort of like really accessible pieces of advice. It's like Torah that's just really um, easy to step into and really relatable. Um, one of the books he has that we're going to see a little bit from is called Likote Etzot. Um, and Likote Etzot, I've translated sort of as like a collection of advice. Um, not, not necessarily his most popular work, but even that Likote Etzot, a collection of advice, it just gives you a sense. It's organized by chapter and he has like a section on anger, a section on despair, a section on family. Um, it's like even just when you glimpse at the, the titles, you're like, oh, actually, like all of this would be so helpful and useful. A section on loss, um, just so much Torah that I think could be relevant to us sort of on, on an everyday basis. OK, that's just to give you a little bit of sense about Rabbi Nachman. Um, we're going to go ahead. Uh, I know that Cyril has shared the source sheet already in the chat, so you have it there. Um, and I'll go ahead and screen share. Um, and as is our way, we'll um, do some learning um, inside of the text and then um, I'll pause, I'll just center this on the screen, I'll pause and then um, turn to the chat so that we can bring in a little bit more conversation. Um, do you feel free if you want to be putting thoughts into the chat, um, even when I'm talking and, and sharing the text, but just know I'm not gonna be looking at the chat while I'm actually like focus on the text itself. And then when I turn to the chat, you'll know that that's where my focus is and then I add to be on the chat. So the, the first text we're gonna look at, this is Rabbi Nachman. Um, it comes from a sefer from a book that's called Sichot Haran, which is like conversations of Rabbi Nachman. Um, and this was all, um, this Torah is all gathered and given over by one of Rabbi Nachman's sort of like foremost disciples who was called Rabbi Nachman. Um, so this is like Rabbi Nachman's Torah as given over by Rabbi Nachman. And, and just to give you a sense of like where we're going today, we're going to look at maybe if we get to all of them, four short teachings of Rabbi Nachman. Um, but each of these teachings, I think, is really like a world onto itself that could open up so much. And sort of like the question I would say is, again, each of these teachings are so short. Um, but the question I would ask is, is um, to what extent do these teachings sort of like resonate with you? And um, where does it hit you in your life? Um, and, and what would you want to take from this teaching? Okay. Misha Yeshlo Emuna. Chayav chayim. So someone who has faith, their life is a life. He, you know, it's translated here as you are truly alive, but like their life is a, is a life. It's a full life. And that person spends their days, um, it sort of in life, every day is good. And when, um, Things go well for that person as is appropriate um, and things are good to them. Certainly it's good for that person. When things are good, things are good. That's easy enough. And even when things are not good, that things sort of like don't go accordingly as they should. And that person has suffering, God forbid. Even in those days when things don't go as they should or as accordingly, and there's a lot of suffering, for a person who has faith, things are still good. Because that person knows with certainty that even so, despite this, the Holy One will have a compassion upon them in the future, and things will um, be good for them in the end. 
because everything comes from God, the, the blessed one, certainly everything is for good, which is to say that when things are good, everyone has faith and things are good. But he's saying for a person who has faith, even when things are bad, when things are going hard, they don't get hung up on that because they know with certainty, even if things are not good now, in the end, things will work out. God will take care of me, whether that's in the end of this life or in the end, like in the end of days. Um, the person trusts that in the end of days, God will sort of provide for them and things will be good. Um, and also knows sort of with certainty, even if things are hard, they take comfort in the fact that everything comes from God. And if it comes from God, it must be good. This is what he's saying, what it means to have faith. Um, the, the, a question I would just ask, not to answer now, um, but just to sort of bring up, you know, as we're moving from, basically in, in each session, we're going to focus on a different thinker and their writings on faith is sort of to put to you, how is Rebbe Nachman's presentation of faith similar or different to the Ish Kodesh's presentation of faith? You know, rem reminding you that the Ish Kodesh was talking about um, faith as sort of this deep soul sight that orients us and brings us closer to God. Um, right now, Rebbe Nachman is giving us language that faith is about um, knowing that in the end, you know, God will have compassion and sort of everything will work out. Um, and, and that faith is about knowing that everything that comes, everything comes from God um, and that everything that comes from God must be good. But someone who doesn't have faith, God forbid, there, you know, there's, you, you have in, um, the translation says, the life of a person without faith is no real life which I think is a fine translation. There's just, I think, something so powerful about hearing it in the Hebrew, like, chayav enam chayim. Their lives are just not life. To, to live without faith is to not live. Because the, the moment that something negative um, comes over them, something bad crosses their path, immediately their life is sort of acting, lacking any vitality, act, lacking any life force. Because the person has nothing from which to take comfort. Because they have no faith at all. They don't have any sort of um, life force and there is nothing good there. Because that person is going through life without God, the Blessed One, and without any sort of um, sense of God's providence, of God watching over them. Um, God sort of, God saved that person. Rahman al-Litz line is like sort of expression saying, God saved that poor person. But through faith, how good and how wonderful um, is their life as we've talked about above. So he's giving us, you know, there's something I think sort of um, simplistic and straightforward about this approach. One is I think he's saying this profound statement that a life without Faith is not a life at all. I wonder, I'd be curious to hear your responses to that, to what extent that feels true to you, a life without faith is not a life, um, or to what extent that feels um, not true to you, that feels problematic or challenging to you. Um, and then also he's just really saying that faith is the thing that um, when things are not good, what the purpose of faith is to offer us comfort so that we are able to get through the times that are hard and know, okay, well, everything comes from God, so it must be good. Or no well, God will take care of me in the end, that that's the, that's the role of faith to so sort of stabilize us and comfort us, um, even in times that are hard. Okay, let me stop screen sharing here. I'm curious to hear, yeah, how does this resonate with your experiences? What do you think about this language of um, someone w living without faith, their life is not a life at all? Um, and does this feel, you know, is this tour that you would want to take with you? So I'm going to officially turn to the chat now. Mm, so Gary says, no, faith is the hunger to understand in the harshest hour. So Gary, it sounds like you're disagreeing with Remy Nachman is presenting here. I'd be curious, Gary, really to hear more about sort of what you feel is, um, <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Yes, I disagree. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, Gary, I would love to be able to hear a little bit more if you could flesh it, it out. I don't know if it's hard for you to do it in the chat. Um, Sort of like he is saying, oh, I almost, Gary, what I'm just inferring into your comments, but I don't know. So please feel free to write more. Is that like he's offering almost like a sort of an easy version of faith of like faith just is sort of like that comfort. And you're saying actually faith is about sort of not sort of like 
skittering superficially on the surface of what's hard, but you're saying actually in the thing that's hard, I'm going deeper into the thing that's hard. Faith is the hunger to understand even the harshest hour. So Gary says, when my life was on the line and I had little chance to live, I was hungry to come face to face with the Almighty. Thank you, Gary, for sharing that. Um, that sounds actually a little bit like some of Rabbi Nachman's teaching in other places, that language of dafka and daika, that it's actually precisely in the moments of darkness or hardship of finding your way to God, of coming face to face. Um, one, of the, one of the places he talks about this is in Torah, um, when God descended on Sinai in the mountain in the cloud, and all of the people saw the cloud and were scared and stood back. And the Torah says that Moshe saw the cloud and stepped into the cloud and approached. And Rabbi Nachman has this beautiful teaching on what separated Moshe from the people. The people in the confusion and the darkness, the people distanced themselves from God. And Moshe actually stepped into precisely the thing that was dark and hard and through that darkness found God. So Gary, that, that I think resonates with other teachings of his. Um, so um, Dr. Anita Rosenfield shares, I know people who say they don't have faith yet their lives are full and they do fantastic things to make life better for others. Or maybe they have faith, but it's in things non-spiritual. So Anita, I really, I do really appreciate that comment. Um, yeah, there's on the one hand, I found his statement so powerful, like a life without faith is not a life at all. It's a very strong statement. And there's something uh, potentially, I don't know, patronizing to say, oh, if you're living without faith, your life isn't a real life. And Anita, you're saying plenty of people's lives are very full lives and they're accomplishing wonderful things with their lives. Who are we to say? Um, you know, even I, I hear this going back to the Ace Codish that the Ace Codish say, God forbid someone who doesn't believe should say they don't believe. Of course you believe, right? That it's like, I'm telling you, even if you feel like you don't believe, I'm telling you, you believe there's something. I think that can be challenging there. Um, and Anita, I'll just say, we might get to this at the end of the class, we'll see, um, but I have a beautiful poem by um, Yehuda Amichai about um, sort of what it means to have faith in things that are not necessarily the spiritual, um, so we can come back to that, Anita. Um, Noreen says, yes, if you are going through troubled times, faith gives you something to hang on to and turn to. Great, Noreen. So that feels like that really does align with this teaching here. Um, Ruth says, perhaps the traditional image of God doesn't inspire faith in many people. Right. So that's interesting, Ruth, is to think about, you know, to what extent our ability to believe in God is tied up with our own um, conceptions or preconceptions of what we think God needs to be. I mean, if we're hung up on God appearing in the world in a certain way, and that doesn't align with our conception of God, that that might distance us from God, and we might not be able to turn to that version of God, that we might need to sort of find the God that works for us um, so that we're able to find our way into relationship there. Mimi says, in addition, those who do not know whether they have faith may realize that they do if they look through the difficulties optimistically. So that's interesting. Maybe that feels like it goes back to the teachings from last week from the Eish Kodesh, um, that it could be that someone feels like they are a no ma'amin, I don't believe, but he's saying, no, 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 you do believe. Um, maybe it's about changing your perspective, finding another way to look at things. So Mary and Jeff say, is faith the only prerequisite to be able to act and to deal with external evil or threat, or is it the only means to be able to fight a battle? Is this not a core issue in modern Israel because it is clear that faith is not enough to deal with the clear threats from places like Iran or Hezbollah? Ah, specifically from Jeff. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a very big question, Jeff. Um, I think for me, that feels like it goes back to the age quotas that we looked at last week with the spies. Um, that the spies are saying, here are some very real issues. We're going to say the thing that is clear and true of what's hard here. And Kaleb says, it's okay. Not, uh, uh, we're just going to go up and we're going to do it. Is faith enough in those circumstances? Or do you both need faith and something else sort of combined with the facts on the ground here? Um, okay, so a lot of other beautiful comments. I just want to also highlight one more. And again, if I'm not reading your comments, it's not because it's not very important. It's just because I'm not able to read all of them. Um, but I'm glad that you're reading them. 
So Stella says, are these words all similar, faith and trust and surrender? So Stella, I love that question. I love that question. I don't think I want to answer it right now, but I want to say, I think that you're right to sort of push for a translation of like, what do we mean when we say emuna? And can we substitute all of these words for each other? I mean, surrender is a very strong and interesting word. Surrender feels like, I don't know, is faith about surrendering? There's something about faith surrendering that's about like a giving in, or is there a passivity? Um, you know, in a sense, I could say like the Eish Kodesh, going back to last week, in a sense, the Eish Kodesh similarly said, um, shared Rabbi Nachman's view that everything comes from God and so everything must be good. He also said, how could he say that during the Holocaust? He also said something that he writes so powerfully. He says that everything comes from good and everything is a chesed from God. Um, and there are pieces where he sort of in protest said, but enough of this chesed that is hidden, that is not revealed. We want sort of the chesed that we could understand that's revealed. Um, so in, in a sense, I would say, I think you could see, Rabbi, you could see the Eish Kodesh as sort of surrendering to the will of God, but also I feel like the Eish Kodesh is not at all surrendering, like surrendering. What the Eish Kodesh is doing is like in defiance of his circumstance, continuing to produce Torah that is so creative and comforting to his people. There's nothing about the Eish Kodesh that's surrendering sort of to the circumstances, even at the same time that he has faith and sort of surrenders to God. So the word surrendering is actually just a very interesting word to think about. Yeah, Howard, thank you for that. Surrender is one meaning of the word Islam. Okay, so let's keep all this conversation going. And I just want to bring us into a little bit more of Rebbe Nachman's text so that we can begin getting a more sort of nuanced idea of what Rebbe Nachman means when he talks about faith. Um, continue to feel free to put your comments in the chat. So this next text also comes from Sichot Haran. So this is also being given over um, from a student, Rabbi Natan. He says, such a strong statement. He says, better to be a fool that believes everything, meaning that you believe even in things that are nonsense and are lies, in order that you also believe in things that are true. Rather than to be a wise person, who sort of denies everything. Another way that I would use this, he's, this is a, not the same language, but like rather to be a wise person who is sort of like cynical or skeptical of everything, and then God forbid, um, so I'll just go on and read a little bit more. So he's saying that the person is the wise person who denies everything, um, including things that make sense, the sense to deny, right? That they know to sort of deny the lies and the nonsense. But as a result, everything becomes sort of foolishness to that person. And they also come to deny and to ridicule the thing that is true. He says, Mutav she akrasho te kol yamai ve al ye rashav. Quoting from Mesechet um, Ediyot from the Gemara, um, better that I should be called a fool all of my days than I be wicked even for just one moment before God. Um, this I thought was so interesting, especially like I think I, I, I fall prey to this myself. It's like my sort of default nature is, I think, to be a little, a little skeptical and cynical of everything, like a little over analytical. And I think he's, the thing he's saying, he's saying just so strong and profoundly, and it's interesting that's like he's saying it, but it's also it's like straight up coming from the Gemara, better that I should be called a fool all my days and be wicked for a moment before God. He's saying, what does that mean? Better that you, you believe everything, even if that makes you a fool sometimes because you're believing things that aren't true, or you're believing foolishness, but that you sort of approach the world with accepting everything at face value, um, including the thing that is true. So you come to like better to sort of approach the world with a simplicity and a trust and a like naivete than to be a chacham. I am discerning. I am skeptical. I am smart. I can discern out the truth. But through that approach to life, the sort of cynical approach to life, you come to God forbid, also reject the things that are true. And that this will then come to distance you, I guess I would just say, to take a step further, he doesn't, 
right? He uses the word lehamin to believe. We don't have to see the word emunah here, but just to say out explicitly that it's like in our sort of um, approaching the world with this cynicism or this sort of like over rationalism, um, this like needing to dissect and discern everything, um, this distrust that it's going to come to also affect our ability to believe in God, because we're going to be so quick to sort of like be cynical even about those things. Well, what kind of God would do this? Or what kind of world would we live in? Or how could it possibly be that? As opposed to actually better just to accept and believe. I'm curious, again, a very, you know, just like in the first teaching, he had that very bold statement, a life without faith is not a life at all. Here, I think he's also saying something so strong, better to believe in everything and be a fool than to be smart. Um, and then through your sort of discerningness, come to reject the truth. I'm curious to hear to what extent do you agree with him here? Or is there something that you feel like, actually, I'm not sure that I would I would go as far as he's going. So I'm going to, I'll stop screen sharing and turn back to the chat. Feel free to um, put your responses in the chat there. Oh, good. Amazing. So Jeff says, I disagree. We need balance, measured skepticism, because the extremes get us into trouble, as with politicians who lie. Faith cannot be absolute, or you get Jacob Frank as one example. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. It's also um, the Rambam, Maimonides, sort of as a Musar practice, as a practice of like ethical behavior, sense, says that most things have to be in balance, that actually anytime you're at one extreme or the other extreme, it can get you into trouble. And so Jeff is saying, yeah, he is setting up, Rabbi Nachman is setting up right now this sort of like dichotomy of you believe everything, even the things that aren't true, you just have to take everything, or you believe nothing, including the things that are not true. And Jeff is actually saying that, that that's that's too much, that we need to be somewhere in the middle with some amount of skepticism, but also having the ability to believe. There's actually this amazing teaching, I think I might have shared it with some of you once before in a previous class, um, that the rabbis talk about um, Rashi, sorry, the Rashi talks about Noah as being ma'amin the eno ma'amin that that Rashi says that Noah is a believer and a not a believer. Why does he say this? Because in the Torah, um, the Torah says that Moshe only went into the ark mipnei hamabul because of the flood. Why should Noah have gone into the ark? Because God told Noah to go into the ark, but God, but Noah doesn't do that. Noah believes in God enough to build the ark but doesn't believe in God enough to get into the ark he built. When does he get into the ark? He only gets into the ark when the floodwaters push him into the ark. That Noah is ma'amin ve'e no ma'amin. He believes and doesn't believe. So Jeff, I hear a little bit of that here, that we have to in life both, you're saying, maybe there's actually, I think that Rashi there was saying that it's a critique of Noah, but maybe there's actually something to be said in our lives for being a balance of ma'amin ve'e no ma'amin, to believe and to not believe, to have some amount of the sort of the ability to trust and be open, but also maybe some skepticism is important. So Arnold says, I may be misquoting, but I recall one of the Hasidic tales from Buber. Buber, students ask the tzaddik if God exists. The tzaddik responds, I don't know, but I must believe. Right. I like that very much. I really appreciate that, Arnold. I was teaching a class when I was, um, but my first right out of rabbinical school, I had a pulpit in St. Paul, and I was teaching a class that I guess was on God to a group of people that were all many, 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 many years my senior, um, and at some point, one of the ladies told, turned to me and said, okay, but Rabbi, tell us the truth about God. Does God exist? Um, and it was for me a little bit of a moment of like, why would you think that I know if God exists? I'm like right out of rabbinical, what, what do I know? Um, but Arnold, I really appreciate this, that it's like even that Sadiq is saying, I don't know, and I choose to believe, right? That sort of takes me back to the language of the Ace Kodesh of like, say the thing that is true, I don't know, I mean, in any event, I believe. Um, Chris says, I think this passage implies a certain humility in life, that we humans cannot completely grasp and understand life, but must depend upon that larger divine being. Oh, Chris, I love that. I think that that's so beautiful. I think that, yeah, I think that that's a great lens onto this. I, you know, I'm focusing more on sort of the simple meaning of this, that it's like better to be a fool, um, you know, if it means then some not rejecting the truth, 
Um, and Chris, I think, I guess what I hear about you saying is like, because we can't know everything as human beings. We can't, we can't rely on ourselves to be the chacham who's able to know and discern. And I know what's true and I don't know what's true, but actually we have to admit with a certain amount of humility, I don't know what's true and what's not true. And so better to like accept that I don't know everything. And with humility, um, you know, through that, I'll be able to come to accept the thing that is true. Thank you, Chris. I think that's really beautiful. Rochelle writes, would you say that the practice of faith I like that language of the practice of faith that takes us back to last week, the Eish Kodesh. Finding faithfulness in your practice of daily living is seeing or seeking the hand face of God in what you encounter. And doesn't that entail a flexible concept of God? Rochelle, I'm not sure if, are you, I'm not sure if you're saying seeing and seeking are the same thing or if you're distinguishing, is it one or the other? Is it seeing or is it seeking? Um, but yeah, Rochelle, I do, I do think that that's a beautiful definition of faith. I think that's really beautiful that the practice of faith is either succeeding in seeing or seeking to see God in everything we encounter. And that's what makes it a practice is because a lot of times maybe we're not going to actually see God. And sometimes we're not going to see God. We're going to be seeking God, but that work of trying to keep coming back to God um, in all of these moments, um, that that's the practice of faith. Rochelle, I think that that's really beautiful. Sometimes you find and sometimes not, sometimes within and sometimes without. Yeah, I think that's beautiful that I love sort of this work of thinking of faith as a practice, that something that we have to work at and come back to. Um, Cyril says, following what Chris said, interesting to think of my fear of being or seeming foolish versus the fear of doing evil or wrong and how much my ego plays into the choice between the two and maybe doesn't allow to fully experience faith. That's very interesting to think of the ways in which fear gets in the way of our faith. Right, I love thinking about the way in which fear gets in our way um, in life, the ways in which fear prevents us from sort of stepping fully into our life, the way that fear prevents us from taking certain risks. Um, but one of the risks that we have to take in life is like being in relationship with God. Um, by two things is to sort of like take that jump and say, you know, in any event, I believe and I'm going forward. Um, so what are the ways in which fear gets in the way of that? Um, I'll just read this last comment by Jeff. For much in life, it is not what we know that harms us, but what we do not know. We need doubt to bring us from the error of missing that which can be fatal. Ha! Huh. We saw this with the management of COVID. Engineers, pilots, doctors, many professions needed skepticism to create safety. Yeah, faith is... <laughs> Right. You could say that we needed like faith to just, you know, for those of us that are not in science or the medical fields, like you could say on one side, we needed faith to trust in the science that was coming out and to say, like, you're telling me to do this. So I'm just going to trust that I'm going to do this. There's also people that had faith on the other side of it. Oh, I have faith that I'm going to be fine. I don't need to do any of those things. The way that faith actually can, you know, thinking of the ways that faith can protect us and faith can be dangerous to us. And so Jeff, what I hear you saying is, and that's where you need some amount of skepticism to come in. Um, okay, so much more to be said. Um, much more to be said. I appreciate your comments in the chat. Please continue um, sharing those. We'll just read on a, a little bit more. I'm going to go back into screen sharing. We can just continue sort of deepening our understanding of Rebbe Nachman here. I love this next text. So this comes from Likote Etzot. Um, the previous texts were from Sichot Aran, Conversations with Rabbi Nachman, given by Rabbi Nathan Likote Etzot. Um, it's sort of like the gatherings of advice, collections of advice on all these different um, topics. Um, so he has one that's specifically on truth and faith. So he says, Faith is dependent upon the mouth of a person. Because you need to speak the faith in the mouth. That it's written, That I will make known your faith in my mouth, through my mouth. Um, I just want to draw this in contrast with the Eish Kodesh, who was, I think, Dafka saying that faith is not dependent. He doesn't use the language of depend, but he was saying, I'm saying that he was saying that the Eish Kodesh was saying faith doesn't depend upon us because faith is inherited 
from our from our ancestor that we just have faith regardless. And even if we be, even if God forbid we're in a moment of enoma amin that I don't believe, he would say, no, that faith is always there. Rabbi Nachman is saying, actually, in order to have that experience of faith, you need to speak that faith. That faith follows your mouth. Um, as we hear in this text, I will make known your faithfulness through my mouth. Meaning what? And God forbid when a person falls from faith, the advice for this person is that they should speak the faith through their mouth, meaning that they should say words of faithfulness. That that person should say with a full mouth, sort of with a full heart that they believe. I will say where I think this does connect back to the Eish Kodesh is the Eish Kodesh last week said, um, if in a moment that a person is feeling like they don't believe, he says, Chas I don't know how he says it, but like Chas Chalilash, that he should say, Enoma Amin, even when he doesn't believe, he believes, right? So the Eish Kodesh is also sort of afraid of people saying out loud that they don't believe. Rabbi Nachman is saying very clearly, where does faith come from? Whereas the Eish Kodesh is saying that faith is always there. You don't have to do anything. Rabbi Nachman is saying in a moment in which you're struggling or failing with your faith, you know, in, in a sense, I think Rabbi Nachman and Eish Kodesh are addressing similar realities. It, it, God forbid, not the reality of the Holocaust, but they're both, I think, speaking to people who are in a moment of faithlessness, who are feeling like they've lost faith, who are broken. Um, the Eish Kodesh's response to someone saying, I don't have any faith. I'm in this place of darkness. The Ish Kodesh's response to that is to say, don't, don't worry about it. If you feel like you don't have faith, that faith is there. That faith doesn't rely on you. That faith is an inherited gift. And that faith is like your breathing and your heart beating. That faith is there for you. That's what the Ish Kodesh would say to someone saying, I don't have faith. What Rabbi Nachman is saying in the moment when someone comes to him and says, I don't have faith. I'm broken. I'm in darkness. I don't have faith. Rabbi Nachman would say, well, what you need to do is just say the words that you want to be true, right? Say, I believe in God. Say, I have faith, because the experience of faith follows what we put into words that this is, I think, is so powerful. What he's saying is that words transform our reality and words can transform our relationship to our faith. This in itself, that the person speaks words of faith through their mouth, this in itself is an aspect of faith. What does it mean to have faith? This is, I think, actually really powerful. What I would think what it means to have faith is to, is to like really deeply believe. And he's saying, actually, an aspect of faith is not really deeply believing. It's actually, maybe you don't deeply believe in the moment. It's actually an aspect of faith is just to say the thing. It's just to say, I mean, I mean, just to say, I believe, to say words that are about trust or faith in God. And maybe even to say words that are about surrender to God, to say that you believe everything comes from God, whatever your sort of definition of faith is there. And I think there's more to flesh out there, but that he's saying it's not actually, I would think that the definition of emunah is about belief. And he's saying actually emunah is not necessarily only about belief. It's also about what is the speech you put out into the world. It's through this act of speech that you will come to merit a full faith. Because faith is dependent upon the mouth of a person, as we said above, that it's through speech that we're going to come to faith. I think that's very powerful. How does what we put out into the world through our, our mouth, how does that affect um, our thoughts and our emotions and how we act in this world? That also the opposite is also true. The epikorsut, and we also that we should also be really careful not to let anything come out of our mouth that is um, that is sort of like any disbelief or rejection of God or heresy, God forbid. I feel the derech late sanut, even if it's sort of like jokingly. I think this is actually really interestingly. Clearly, we shouldn't say anything that sort of belies um, a lack of faith and say it in earnest. But he's saying, even if you don't actually mean the thing you're saying, you're just sort of being cynical or sardonic or flip, flippant. You're even just sort of flippantly saying something. He says, you have to also really watch out for your language there. That even a person that in their, in their heart, they truly do believe, right? They're just saying something flippantly. But they're actually like saying something that someone else said, right? They are a true believer. 
I'm just repeating something that, can you believe that so-and-so said this thing about God? But just by allowing those words to come out of my mouth, um, that, that I'm saying something in someone else's name and I'm sort of like making fun of them. He says, Gam zehu isur gadol. This is also very forbidden. Because this act of speaking these words, even if you're saying them jokingly, even if you're saying them in order to ridicule the other person for their lacking faith, this will come to damage your own faith. Why? Because our speech matters. Because the words we put out into the world create the reality that we live in. He says, Ki al Hashem asur lamar halatzot. Um, that on the, uh, the the Holy One, it's forbidden to say um, things sort of even um, even in jest, um, to say things that are um, sort of mocking God, even if we're saying them jokingly, even if we're saying them in the name of someone else, um, that we have to be so careful with our speech here. Why? Because, and it's interesting, I think he's saying two things. You could say, well, why is it forbidden to say things sort of that are negative about God? You could say, because that's like exhibiting a lack of faithfulness to God. It's disrespecting God, right? On the face of it, it sounds like, you know, it's forbidden to say disrespectful things about God. That could have been the end of it, but he's not just saying that. He's saying it's forbidden to say things that are disrespectful about God. Why? Because it will come to damage your own faith. It's like, it's not only, or it's not about God hurting God's feelings. It's actually what it does to your own experience. And so his advice here is if you find yourself in a moment in your life where you are feeling like you don't have faith, what should you do? The age quota says, don't worry, that faith is there for you. You can rely on the sort of faith that it's given down. The, the Rabbi Nachman is saying, say the thing through your mouth, that sometimes just speaking faith is in itself an aspect of faith, even if in that moment you don't believe. And then maybe through that, you'll come to believe. Okay, I just want to read this with one more text, um, right back to back, and then we'll turn to... Um, We'll turn to the chat. So this, we're going back to Sichot Haran, the, the Torah that's handed over to Rabbi Natan, his student. He says, Shayach la Torah kushia roshe tebot shma Hashem koli ekra. So roshe tebot is like um, an acronym, you know, if you like take the first letter of every word. And he says, um, the Torah gives us an acronym. If you take the pasuk, if you take the verse, shma Hashem koli ekra, God hear, um, God, hear my voice, I will call, or I will call, and God will hear my voice. If you take the first letter of each of these and rearrange them, you get the word kushia, a difficulty, a challenge, that contained in this verse in which we're saying, I will call, and God will hear my voice, you get the word kushia, which in itself means a difficulty. What does that mean? So what's the Torah he's going to make on it? He says, the ha'ikar, he says the essence of it is the crying out in one's heart. This in itself is the aspect of faith. So this, I think, is very connected to his other Torah, where he said, you might have thought that what faith is, is believing. And he's saying faith is not just believing, or it's not only believing. There he was saying, Faith is about speaking the thing out, even just speaking something that at the moment doesn't feel true to you. That's an aspect of faith. Here he's saying, I think he's going even a step further. Here he's saying, you're not even actually like saying, I believe in God. Here you're actually just crying out sort of in sadness or desperation or a loss or confusion. You're, you, It seems like in this text, we can't even get ourselves to say, I mean, we can't even get ourselves to say the thing of, I believe in God. We're not even at that place. We're just at the point of sort of like the wordless cry. And he's saying the wordless cry in our heart, this is in itself an aspect of faith. <laughs> Even though like these um, sort of doubts and these questions and these difficulties. So here's this kushia is going back to the language here that contained in um, I will cry and God will hear me. This forms the acronym for the word kushia, a difficulty. He said, even though um, I'm at this moment, there are all these questions and difficulties that are coming to me. Because at um, e even with all of this, that I am that the person is crying out um, from his heart, 
בוודאי עדיין יש בו ניצוץ או נקודה מהאמונה הקדושה. It's the fact that the person is crying out, even with all the difficulties that they're experiencing in the morning, the fact that they're crying out means that there must still be this spark, um, this point of holy faith. Because God forbid, if that were not the case, because if God forbid it was not the case that there wasn't any point of faith still in that person, they wouldn't cry out at all. And we find from this that the crying out in itself, even if that cry is a cry of, where are you, God? I don't feel you, God. You have abandoned me. I am suffering. Even if that's the cry, he's saying the fact that you are crying at all reveals that there's still something there. Because if there wasn't that point of faith there, you would just not be in relationship to God. You would have removed yourself from relationship to God. But the fact that you are crying out to God in the midst of the kushia, in the midst of the difficulty, that reveals that you still have this aspect of faith. So before we were hearing, okay, even if you don't have faith, even if you feel like you don't believe, at least say, I believe, and just the act of speaking counts towards your faith. Here we're, we're getting to, even if you're not able to bring yourself to say the words that you're just in the place of the cry and the hardship, I think he's comforting. And, you know, certainly the person here who's crying out, this person is certainly the person that's coming to Rabbi Nachman and saying, I don't believe, right? I'm broken. I don't believe. He's saying, you know, the fact that you were crying out means you are still in relationship and you should be comforted to know that that's, that's okay. That's enough. That's your faith right now. That's where you are. And that's your faith. Last part. He says, and it's through this crying out that the person will come to merit faith. Again, very similar to the language in the other one. Through the act of speaking the thing, you will come to a complete faith. Now we're not even able to speak it. We're just crying out. But that actually the crying out is going to get us to the place we want to be. That actually the crying out itself is like an aspect of faith, as we said above. It's just that at the moment the faith is in this, it's sort of, it's like a contradiction in words. is like sort of in this great smallness. It's like so, so, so very small, the aspect of faith. But through crying out, the person is going to grow that faith and they'll come to merit a full faith. That they'll come and grow their faith until the questions, the difficulties leave that person. This is so interesting, right? The whole purpose he's saying is that the crying out itself is an aspect of faith. And it's through this crying out that we're going to come to get to a full faith, right? That ultimately we're trying to get to the state of full faith. And here he says, even if we don't merit this, even if we never get to a place of complete faith, we stay in that crying out, we stay in the small place of faith our whole lives. The crying out in itself is still very good, as we said above. This, I think, is very powerful, that it's like, he's, both, he's, he's doing a couple of things. On the one hand, he's saying, it's okay to not have faith. It's okay just to be in the crying out stage. The crying out is faith, right? Take comfort in that. On the other end, he's saying, really, you want to get to the place where you have a full faith, and the crying out is going to get you there, okay? The crying out is going to be your vehicle for full faith. And then he's taking a step back, and again, he's giving us permission and giving us sort of like forgiveness for, her, for ourselves. And he's saying, but even if you never get to that place of full faith in your life, it's okay, because the crying out, just being in relationship with God, even if that relationship is one of crying out, um, that in itself is very good. Rebbe, um, the H quarter says um, something similar to that, that is so powerful. Um, we, we didn't read this next, we didn't read this last week, but there's a different Torah that he says, where he basically says, as long as you are bringing your questions and your doubts to God through prayer, and you're in relationship with God, he uses that same language. He says, it's very good. But he says, the minute that you're having questions and doubts about God, and you're not bringing them to God, you're bringing them somewhere else, God forbid. Or then he says, even if you're not bringing them somewhere else, they're just festering in your own heart. They're just in your heart. Then God forbid, that's very bad because that's distancing from your from God. But again, the Eish Kodesh in this other piece of Torah, he's saying like, what is prayer? 
it's okay for prayer to be a place of bringing your doubts and your questions and your anger and your sadness and loss as long as you are staying in relationship. It's only a problem when you're not bringing it to God. And again, I think that that's what he's saying here. That's like, as long as you're crying out, it means that you already have this aspect of faith. Okay, that was a lot, those two texts together. So let me stop here. And I would love to hear um, your responses to those two, how, how you feel that they're landing. You know, I think this is very profound that he's saying, in terms of we were asking the question of what does it mean to have faith? What do we mean when we say the word? Here he's saying faith is not necessarily about belief. Faith is sometimes about just saying the thing that we don't believe, being in that attempt. Faith is sometimes about just crying out um, that, that we wish we believed or that, I mean, maybe not even crying it out, crying out against God. Um, but that, that could still be an act of faith. Okay. <laughs> Deb said, is Rabbi Nachman saying a bit of fake it until you make it? Yeah, Deb, I think that is what he's saying. I think he's definitely saying a bit of fake it until you make it. Um, and amazingly, he's saying, and even if you don't make it, it's okay that you faked it, <laughs> right? Sometimes you might not actually even make it. Okay, is Rebbe Nachman writing from the perspective of the need to deal with their darkness so that so many communities had experienced with the pogroms under Kmelnitsky's a generation before him? That his people needed a way to absorb the magnitude of destruction. Right, that's very interesting. Right. What what is the you know, I think Rabbi Nachman is writing to a lot of different people here. You know, I, I think he's writing to people that just sort of on an everyday. I, I think I think he could be writing to people that are suffering with all sorts of different types of experiences with suffering and darkness, whether it's personal suffering and darkness of like losing kids in childbirth or or losing God forbid one's partner, um, whether it's about like the sort of inherited trauma or trauma that one has gone through through these programs, as you're saying. Um I think there could be a, a, what what I think is so amazing about Rabbi Nachman's writing um, is that there. I think he is speaking personally, um, but his writing is really accessible to a, a wide level, a wide audience of people that might be struggling with darkness in different ways. Kathleen says, "The fact that someone says I have no faith seems to be contradictory. To even think I don't have it means, at some deep level, there is faith." I believe faith is a gift from a loving God. Each receives more or less. We have to choose to accept and like all gifts and talents, use it or lose it. Well, Kathleen, I think that that's beautiful. The idea that just to even think that I don't have faith must mean at some deep level there is faith. I think that is, I don't know, Kathleen, if I, I want to, I want to believe that that's true. I think that would certainly make me feel a lot better about my own relationship to faith. Um, but Kathleen, I think that you're right. I think that is what he's saying. That I think he's saying the very act that you are sort of like mourning a, a loss of faith must mean that you are, that, that you were longing for it, must mean that you are in relationship to it and that there is some sort of faith there. So Kathleen, I do think that that's right there. So Howard says, just saying words representing faith, like just reading the text of prayers, is very different than doing the action that represents your faith which might be saying the words of prayers to Hashem. If I read a prayer in Hebrew and I don't understand the words, how can that create a faith in Hashem that I don't have? The words we use to cry out in our heart are completely different than reading words of Hebrew that we don't understand. Well, Howard, that is beautiful. That is very interesting. I think we actually, um, and I don't know if we personally, but we did actually look at a class. I did teach a former CSP class that was about um, praying. How can I pray? Praying in a language that I don't understand. There's a real machloga. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not we can pray. Is it really important that we pray in Hebrew? For those of us that, if we're not fluent in Hebrew, is it really important and essential that we pray in Hebrew? Or is actually more essential? Is it important to pray in the language of our ancestors, or more important to pray in a language that we understand? Um, so Howard, I, I think that's really interesting. If part of what praying is supposed to do is to express a commitment of faith that we may or may not have at that moment, it's important, is it important that I deeply understand the words that I'm saying? I do think that in Rebbe Nachman, that language of the tsa'aka, the cry of one's heart, does seem to be talking about a relationship to prayer that is more sort of like free form, or at least one is like connected to the, it, it almost feels to me like he's talking about a form of prayer that might even be sort of before speech or beyond speech, that it's not actually about 
the words at all. It's about even just the emotion. But Howard, I, I do think that that is right and interesting, sort of bringing up the question of to what extent when we're using prayer as a vehicle to get us to faith, to what extent sh should we be praying sort of in the traditional language or should we be praying in our own language so that's our heart crying out? Rabbi, please explain what your faith contributes to the richness, richness of your life quality. Well, that's a very personal question. I think we should probably end with that question. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit sniffly. I have a cold. Um, please explain what my faith contributes to the richness of my life quality. So you're really asking me how, what I think, what I think, where faith is for me. Um, I don't think that I have the faith of Rabbi Nachman. I don't think I have the relationship to faith that when things are hard or bad, that I either say, well, everything comes from God, and so it all must be good, nor do I think I feel, um, well, everything's going to work out in the end because God will take care of me in the end. I don't think I have that relationship to faith. That sounds very nice, and I could see that that would be comforting. I don't think that I have that relationship to faith. I think for me, um, I feel closest to this. I feel particularly drawn to the texts around Rabbi Nachman that are about sort of like an aspiring to faith or being in relationship to faith. Um, and I think faith in not knowing. So I guess I, I'm just sort of finding my way into an answer to your very important and good question, which is to say, I resonate with a lot of the comments around faith and humility. Um, I think for me, the richness that it adds is an acceptance that I don't, I don't know everything in the world and I don't understand everything in the world. Um, and in all the ways in which I, I sort of don't know and don't understand, um, in all the ways in which I like can't, might not see and experience God and that that's a big question in my life. I'm sort of willing to, in those moments, have some sort of faith. Um, and I think that faith is not like that God is there or it's all good or everything's going to work out. I sort of think I'm using faith in the sense of that I just don't know, that I, that I don't have the answers. And I guess that makes me feel better um, because instead of being in the hardness of the black and white of I don't know, it leaves me in sort of in the humility and the hopefulness of, well, maybe there just is. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. For, for me, faith is not about, um, whereas like I think the Ace Quotas was writing about faith as a deep soul sight of like trusting that faith more than we trust the thing that's in front of us. I don't think faith is quite, I'm not quite there. But I think for me, if I didn't have faith, I would be only in the hardness of I don't know. Um, and I think faith allows me to say more in a place of sort of hope and wonder and humility um, and in relationship. Thank you for allowing me that sort of rambling answer as I found my way into that. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing to explore these things over the next couple of weeks with you. Thanks for that question. Thank you, Rabbi Avi. And thank you for talking and speaking faith with us, uh, possibly bringing that act to life. Uh, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts and your comments and being so uh, fully engaged. Uh, it's beautiful to read and to see. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Toda. Thank you.